what it says it's being live streamed but can someone check Facebook for me just doing that now for you Sound of here. Ah, it's up. Okay. Sure is. It's all good. Lovely. Well, th our, oh, wonderful. Thanks, James. Well, I, I just want to welcome everybody um, who's joining us today, tonight, this afternoon for the um, the Zoom webinar. Um, today, I have collected three of my friends who also happen to be examiners. So I'll start by introducing them. So I'll, I'll go anti-clockwise for me. So I've got um, Jane, who examines for the Australian Music Examination Board, which is an Australian board, um, and does face-to-face -face examinations. And then next I have Mark, who's um, the Chief Examiner for uh, Music Teachers Board. Now have I got that right? So which MTB, yeah. as we, we refer to it on Facebook. And then Peter Wang, who's the oldest of my friends in this 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 Zoom room, um, he is the um, chief executive officer for Conbrio Examinations, which um, it has offices in Sydney and Beijing in China, Shanghai, Shanghai. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I saw your mouth moving and heard no sound. While Peter sorts that out, um, he won't be able to unmute. Oh, that's the problem. Thank you, but I can ask him to unmute. Thank you, the clever person who told me what's going on. Oh, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, for those who are watching our live stream, um, we have a comment in the chat which says he was muted during the great music. <clears throat> O2. Um, <laughs> um, today, um, this was actually Jane's idea. So uh, if it doesn't go well, we can all blame her. Um, the, the idea of thinking of what sort of things, when, when we're putting people in for exams, we don't always think about how an examiner looks at what we're sending and, and how they're thinking and some of the challenges to do with examining. So I'm very thankful um, f to, to have everyone be able to join tonight and um, so we can discuss some of these issues. But the first and most important issue is what tea do examiners drink? So Mark, you're in my top left, so you go first. What tea are you drinking? Well, I'm in England, so I'm, in, uh, I'm drinking what we call uh, builder's tea, which is <laughs> just a cup of normal, um, I don't know, in England we just all drink English breakfast tea, I think. That's what it's usually referred to. So actually I don't even know what the variety is apart from that. <laughs> <laughs> and Jane, what are you drinking? Well, I don't drink tea. Um, I'm a coffee girl and no instant in this house. So there's a real machine with espresso and if in doubt, because if I drink too much, I get a little bit jittery. And so <laughs> uh, my students all know that I will then defer to Coke Zero as a uh, after water that I must admit, I because I spend a lot of time, I teach completely online. I don't do any face-to-face -face lessons um, and I examine face-to-face, -face, but I also do video exams um, in contemporary and piano for leisure for Amy B. So I find it really important to stay hydrated because you end up speaking more, if, if I forget to balance the volume on the computer, I end up using my teacher's voice, which is projects. And so I find that I need to stay hydrated all the time and water are followed by Barocas, followed by zero are my go-tos to start with, yes. And then coffee. <laughs> well, Peter, what's your drink of choice tonight? Oh, well, I'm usually like Jane, I love my coffee. <laughs> But um, tonight I'm actually drinking um, a red tea, just a pour from Beijing, yeah. But nice. usually Earl Grey, it's probably the equivalent of Earl Grey in the uh, UK. And, and I, I must confess, I hope Tom Potter is listening because this is a peppermint tea, um, which is what I always drink after 6pm at night if I want to actually sleep <laughs> when it's bedtime. So now to more, more oh, and everybody who's here, if you want to put in the chat what you're drinking at the moment 
and feel free to um, and in the the Facebook live stream feel free to tell us where you're watching from um, so it's a very we're a very lucky very multicultural group um, okay so now um, I get I think I'll just keep going around Mark then Jane then then Peter so um, Mark in order to take your role as chief examiner what qualifications were expected of you to, to, to do this okay well um, it's the, the MTB is the, the Music Teachers Board, and basically the way examiners, um, what is expected of an examiner to be qualified, if you like, to be an examiner is not necessarily just, obviously, uh, high-level qualifications such as uh, diplomas, degrees, work kind of thing, but actually what what is really looked for is uh, experience as a teacher and a performer, because we are the Music Teachers Board and it is from a music teacher's perspective that everything is being marked. So we expect all our examiners to be, um, and the point is that I suppose what, what um, is different and, and therefore sort of has a big effect on what you're asking is that with MTB, um, we only use specialist examiners. So a trumpet exam, I'm a trumpet player by the way, will only ever mark a trumpet exam. A violinist will only ever mark a violin exam a guitarist a guitar exam so you have to be kind of show ex uh, great expertise and uh, successful career really <laughs> as a teacher and performer on the instrument that you play so as a trumpet player i've, I've you know i've been a, an, an instrumental teacher for 40 years so i feel i've got a lot of experience of using all the balls and understanding the levels and things so that that gives me an extra qualification if you like beyond written qualifications and also just the fact that I've had a long and varied performing career. Um, just gives me the technical knowledge I need to be able to be able to comment properly on, on what I'm hearing. So it's, it's really, we're looking for experienced performers, teachers and experts in the instrument which they're examining. Thanks, Mark. And how about you, Jane? Well, AMEB examiners, um, pretty much across the board, like most exam boards, want uh, examiners who are very experienced teachers and the term that's preferred is distinguished teachers whatever that means um, so a distinguished teacher generally is someone who has put a certain number of students through any exam board it doesn't have to be Amy B's but proof that you have put so many students through in your specialist area um, and Amy B also generally prefer to uh, exa have examiners examine only in their specialist instrument where possible, not always, because we also have to remember that we are a small country, uh, spread a small population spread over a very large geographical area. So having the luxury of an examiner who's a specialist in a particular area isn't always possible. So I personally uh, would prefer not to examine classical. I will prefer to, to examine contemporary and that's an area that I've chosen to specialise in. So that's whether that's popular jazz, um, essentially anything that isn't termed traditional Western music, uh, and that's just a preference. As far as qualifications are, con are concerned, it's really a case of, again, having a distinguished, recognised uh, type of qualification. So it really depends. In Australia, having a bachelor degree is a really big deal. Um, now, whether that's a bachelor of music or a bachelor of education, in my case, I have one of each. Um, but there are also the grandfather grandfathering in where bachelor degrees weren't always available. And so there are many AMEB examiners who've been examining for 30 or 40 years who have only a diploma or a licentiate or a fellowship but that coupled with an, a known performing career or recording or writing or examining usually a combination of all of those things um, so the, the whole point is that an examiner is someone who can give um, a very experienced report for the student and the teacher on areas that perhaps could be improved upon and uh, where possible give some suggestions as to how to achieve that. Ada? Yes, definitely. Yeah, I think um, it's a combination of uh, professional degree qualification as well as teaching experience, practical teaching experience. Um, 
uh, I grew up with the uh, sort of the Trinity background as well as the AMEB background. So we're quite familiar with all these um, international um, examinations for that's been around for quite some time. And um, I think it's, it is important that um, uh, as a, uh, when it comes to um, online exams, we're uh, appealing to a um, worldwide audience and a lot of um, uh, parents and candidates, they do wish their exam um, are marked by uh, pr music professionals. So um, I think I'll say uh, we uh, at the um, Combrew exams, we do accept uh, very various qualifications from uh, professional B uh, BMAS or MAS or all the way to um, uh, just a di teaching diploma or, or like a, a advanced diploma from various um, a professional institution or examination board, they're all accepted, but very importantly, we do um, ask the examiners to let us know their previous teaching experience as well as music assessment experience, because a lot of this is um, it all comes to practical um, teaching based, um, because if they're not um, experienced teachers themselves, they probably won't be able to deliver really constructive comments or like uh, criticisms or understand how much effort it actually takes for the teacher to actually achieve um, the candidate's work to a certain layer level as per se, yeah. Thanks everyone. So the next question I have is a specific question about your story. So when you were learning your first instrument, so not, not subsequent ones, your first instrument, how many hours of practice were you doing a day? So Mark. Well, I'm very lucky because I'm a brass player and we're very limited on how long we could actually keep going before we would actually uh, physically run out of uh, the energy to do so. So, um, I mean, the maximum of practice I ever personally did a day was four. Um, but um, generally, um, it's just quite interesting that because when I was doing, uh, you know, as a student, I was doing my, or my orchestral auditions to, to get into various orchestras and things. I remember I was doing about two hours practice a day at that point. And then I did an audition. I didn't get the job. And I thought, well, I wonder what happens if I do four hours a day, because I felt pretty exhausted, actually, on a brass instrument after two hours of practice, because um, it's physically very demanding. Um, I thought, what happens if I do, if I did twice as much practice for, would I be twice as good? Why would I do twice as well? I thought I probably wouldn't, but it was my guess. But actually, funnily enough, it did make a massive difference finding a way to actually, um, if you like, uh, um, moderate my practice so I had the uh, capacity to keep going for that length of time actually did produce gre greater results. And that was quite an interesting thing because it wasn't obvious to me that that would be the case. I thought once I'm exhausted, I'm exhausted. But actually, you know, finding better ways to practice, and I think we've all learned that over the years, you know, how to practice and how to not exhaust yourself basically before you've actually achieved something in your practice. So I think that was what I learned at that point. And, uh, but I did know a, a chap who, who uh, got a, a very serious injury, a trumpet player, a friend of mine, and he moved over to the trombone um, and because he had to, and he did 10 hours practice a day. And within a year, he was already playing with the Halle Orchestra in, in the UK, which is a, a phenomenally good orchestra. So, you know, practice does pay off. And don't follow my example of a brass player just doing two hours. That's because I couldn't really do much more physically. I'm going to, before I ask James, I, I had trumpet lessons with David Bilger from the Philadelphia Symphony Orchestra. And I remember him saying that the violinist in the orchestra were doing eight hours a day. But he could only do an hour and a half a day on the days that he wasn't performing and even less on the days that he was so that he could keep his mouth in top form. And, and he said, because of this, I had to practice with a lot more wisdom and carefulness, whereas a, as a pianist who was doing eight hours a day, I never, I never bothered. You know, it was like, oh, yeah, eight hours. But when, you're, when you do, are limited by what your body can actually handle, which is a, an issue for brass instruments, you have to practice smart. So, yes, it's absolutely. It's, it's a very different ball game. But anyway, there's my, my, my two cents worth. Jane. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, just checking because Sarah, you've muted yourself. Okay, um, I have my personal experience was quite different because I grew up in country New South Wales and the largest town or village that I ever lived in 
had only a few thousand people and my parents would move around fairly regularly starting a business building it up selling it and then we'd move somewhere else so I had a variety of teachers over the years sadly none of whom really did it for me so I've always felt like I was self-taught and it wasn't until I got to university and was doing my bachelor degree that I really started to understand what practice actually was the good part about it though was that I'm I'm the sort of musician who prefers to play and practice separately even though depending on how you play that could actually be counted towards practice now as a piano player and as a violinist um, but particularly as a piano player I can practice in my head while I'm driving holding the steering wheel and practice certain fingerings or coordinations or hear something um, and actually get really clear in my head what I want it to sound like and get the phrasing right and all those sorts of things and I can actually practice that away from the instrument and I've always done that when I was on the bus on my way to school or whatever so when you ask the question how many how much time did you spend practicing for me probably 30 minutes a day all the way through until graduation however in addition to that, there, there was a lot more time spent playing, but playing on the steering wheel, in the car, in a band, you know, um, recording things, whatever it was. It all sort of contributed to the overall improvement of skill sets, if that makes sense. So I've always struggled with the idea of you have to have, I tell my students this as well. Um, I, particularly the parents please don't time your child this whole idea of 30 minutes a day of practice is absolute rubbish for not least of which is the average adult can only focus for about 17 minutes a day you know, at a time so even if you are practicing beyond that 17 minutes that mental ability to focus in such a detailed way is not something that is necessarily achievable so I, that's what I, so my experience is I need to differentiate between playing and practice, even though in my experience it was both. Thanks, Jane. And Peter. Uh, yes, when I was a student, I probably practiced on an average an hour a day. And um, that's when I was learning and possibly a little bit more, two to three hours when it comes to exams, uh, days before the exam or days before concert preparation. Um, and then it was only until when I um, uh, was studying piano as a professional uh, at uh, joining in the conservatorium. Uh, I was probably doing about four to five hours, but I think um, I agree with um, Jane and um, Sarah. I think what you mentioned was very important. I think we have to always distinguish the difference between playing and practicing, because when you're playing through pieces, it could be um, not um, making any progress, but just um, solely for the sake of playing through the piece or for the so enjoyment. But then uh, when we're actually doing the work, I think um, productive practice, if you actually do really productive practice, it doesn't really take that long to actually get something fixed. And then it, uh, I think that's when um, people say, you know, like, should I actually practice smart and not just practice hard? I think that's very important. I just wondered if it's possible to step in on that. Is it, is it possible to make another comment there? Because um, I thought it was really interesting what Jane said, actually. Um, and um, uh, I think to me, that is the great thing about music or playing an instrument in particular, which educationally makes it uh, something that is so valued throughout uh, all up higher education. Because if you have the tenacity and the ability to focus day on day for, I know Jane says you can only concentrate for a certain number, but people doing music practice are showing that they can focus for quite long spells of time um, on what they're doing and in a very focused way. I think that educationally that shows something very important about, about a person. And that's why it's valued as something when you send in your application to higher education and you say that you play an instrument to a high level, they know that you are somebody probably who has that ability to study and focus uh, in a tenacious way. Just thought I'd mention that. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, always, it's, it's, we're very free in here. Always feel free if you want to add. I'm not not bothered. Um, now, my next question, again, just a, a general question. So um, starting with you, Mark, what is your favourite part about examining? Well, <laughs> actually, 
funnily enough, with MTB, you're getting uh, recordings uh, of a, because the way it works, I don't know if everyone's familiar, but basically the teacher is delivering the exam uh, with the student. So there's a student interacting with the pupil and they are telling them what to do. And they're acting like a, like Jane would be acting in the exam itself, I guess. You know, they're the kind of visiting examiner, but it's the teacher and the, and the relationship between the teacher and the pupil is usually just so joyful. Not always, not always, don't get me wrong, but very often there's this real joyful and, and, and lovely. And of course, because they're dealing very often with very tiny people, they're having to cajole them in the right way to understand what they're, and I just find that really endearing. If I'm honest with you, I find that absolutely charming. I love it. And then sometimes what I find extraordinary is when you just you just listen to what you're listening to and you just go, wow, that is unbelievable. Um, and it's so, it just actually, I'm, I'm, if I'm perfectly honest with you, it does almost bring a tear to my eye to think that we're able to offer that uh, to people to be able to get to that level and to do that and it just really and give them the ability to to uh, show what they can do i just i just i just love those areas really the interaction and suddenly we're hearing something which is just so wonderful jane favorite part of examining um i don't know i have a lot of them i like i really like the little ones the four five six year olds uh just so adorable and the fact that they are so serious and everything has to be just so I you know um, I guess my favorite part about that is I often think the parents are much more stressed and the teachers are and the kid just waltzes in and says look what I can do you know so I really enjoy that sense of confidence and the lack of self-consciousness um, I also really enjoy the moments where I'm listening to something and I think oh, I really must write something, <laughs> you know, because it's just so beautiful. It's just so expressive and the character has come through. And clearly the student has forgotten that it's an exam and they're just enjoying their music. So that was that's usually my favourite part. Um, but another one that's really important for me is because I also have uh, a child who's special needs, um, I find it really easy to put a clearly very anxious student um, very quickly put them at ease a little bit and there have been a number of times where a student you know a candidate will start and I just say to them look would you like to start again shall we just start again and let's just pretend that that was your you know whatever whatever it's going to take really just to get that candidate comfortable and my view is that what I'm trying to examine is their ability to express their music, not their ability to manage their own anxiousness and nerves. And hopefully over time, by having a positive experience in this examination, whether it's as a video in live or whatever, hopefully over time they'll, they'll have experienced something in a really positive way, which in the future will diminish any nerves coming up. Jane and Peter. Well, my favorite part, well, being uh, with computer exams, being an um, online examination, I think uh, my favorite part is watching kids from all around the world um, attempting different paces and trying their best in delivering a good performance because it's actually quite interesting because people in different parts of the world, they have um, paces that's probably trending in certain places. And then so it's not always the same. And um, I think uh, uh, as uh, Mark and Jane were saying, I think it's always very, very nice because I think uh, when it comes to a, perform a performance assessment, you see a lot about the, ca uh, the character of the candidate. And I think uh, when they really showcasing themselves and they're really delivering the piece, or if it's a piece that you particularly like or I particularly like, and then you think, wow, I tend to be extra encouraging when it comes to that. It doesn't ne necessarily need to be the, let's say the most perfect performance, but and um, I think it's the, the when, when you can see the joy and when you can see the kids really, really got it and then it's really bringing life to their music. I think that's what makes it really special. And then, yeah, that's my favorite part. I must say there was a, a funny story that came to me just thinking, thinking about this question, actually, a, a very funny moment in an exam many, many years ago um, when I was uh, accompanying a pupil and the examiner, she, this was a quite difficult pupil to manage, really, this pupil. And the 
Damon said, would you like to play your first piece, play the first piece? So he started playing a piece and I started accompanying. I, I soon realised that what the candidate was playing and what I was playing were literally not the same piece. And I, I, I said, to him, I had to start, I said, I'm sorry, I have to stop. I said, what are you, what are you playing? Uh, which piece are you playing? Well, I'm playing, are you playing this piece? No, no, I'm playing number one because the examiner played, said play the first piece. So I thought I had to play the first piece in the book. So they played the first piece in the book instead of the one. And then they actually performed the correct piece and got to the end. And then when they finished, they stopped and said, well, I thought that was really rather good, didn't you? Which I thought was a lovely comment to say to the examiner. <laughs> Can I, I uh, sorry, I've just got one more like that, which I think is, is very valid. And that is a couple of weeks ago, I was examining some video exams, which are pre-recorded. So Amy B's one is where they play three or four pieces in one take. And then that whole video is uploaded and it's examined. And one particular candidate, bless her heart, had the cat wandering in through halfway through the exam with a meow meow played at you know appropriate times and then halfway through the next piece the mother sort of crawled into the camera view to grab the cat and take it away um, by which time the dog escaped and started yipping and it was just the most it was the funniest exam I've ever had you know to mark but to the candidate's uh, credit she just ignored it, focused and just kept going. The show must go on. So yes, I really, I did enjoy that one. I'm, I just, I just interrupt to say, I think there's an issue with the live stream. So I'm going to start recording again. It's not going to record anyone in the room except for us four that are being spotlighted. So um, you will get the notification that the meeting's being recorded just because the live stream seems to be having trouble. So in saying that maybe the recording so um but anyway so um, thanks everyone um now the the next question now this is um um oh what now no most important question what is your most preferred drink while you are examining mark well you see now you've got to be a bit careful with a brass player here because um uh i i uh I remember going to do a concert and we were we were in the in this sort of dressing room, it was a brass ensemble, and the guy came up and said, What would you like to drink? And we all asked for a cup of tea. And he said, Are you sure? Are you sure you're brass players, aren't you? So obviously there's a kind of expectation with brass players that we'll go for something a little bit stronger. But if I'm honest with you, <laughs> I'm one of these very boring brass players. No, no, I'm I'm not in this case. I'm a perfect brass player in that I like to have a nice cup of tea when I'm examining actually. <laughs> Jane? Well because I'm a lady of a certain age I tend to avoid having something to drink during the exam so that I can actually stay for the whole exam without needing to leave <laughs> with any difficulty. Um, but I do find that because when you're doing live exam face to face, because the rooms are relatively small, the odour of something that I'm drinking can be quite off-putting to some candidates. So I'm very conscious of of it being both ways because I can tell you that after a day of examining teenagers where bless their hearts they've all come in one after the other with their own brand of, it, of aftershave and perfumes and all the various smells of the lip glosses and things the last thing I want to do is contribute to that overall coffee smell or coffee breath or anything along those lines because in a face-to-face -face exam I do have to get quite close to them if I'm doing the oral section or asking questions where I need to point to something so I, I tend to avoid having something during as opposed to between candidates yeah. oh Peter Hi. Uh, for me, it's actually coffee. <laughs> I prefer coffee <laughs> and coffee with milk, uh, coffee with oat milk. Um, I, I think it's just nice to to help me stay awake and then clear the mind. And um, I think it's nice sometimes uh, just uh, back in the days when I was doing um, life exams as well. I think it's nice when you have a, um, a cup of coffee there and just probably relaxes the environment a little bit more. I think just uh, to, to me, I think that just helps. Um, otherwise, uh, I remember back in the days when I was doing uh, life exams, I think can be the, the room sometimes can be quite cold, especially on a winter day. And then the whole atmosphere, and if you come 
comes uh, across a probably a quieter candidate and as the whole atmosphere can be quite cold and probably not not I think we want something to warm up the whole atmosphere yeah um, now I to Mark and Peter um, when you are do you have a preferred time so when the exams come in is there a, a time of day that you go this is my favorite time to examine Mark first if I'm honest with you, um, I don't actually. I don't have a particular time of day that I, I examine better than another. I just, I think the thing is, it's a very busy uh, schedule I have. And I think what I want to find is time when I can actually concentrate and do it in a focused way. So it's just finding the right time rather than a specific time. And that's the beauty, I suppose, of an online system is that you are able to do it when it suits you and you're feeling at your best. And, but uh, there isn't a, I don't say, right, I'm going to do it between these hours and these hours. That's not how I do it. And Peter? Uh, when it comes to online exams, usually at night, I think um, probably after dinner, so that I know I'm not in a rush. And um, so I know I have plenty of time to take as much. I think this taking as much time as I need to, to actually do a good assessment, I think is quite important. I think that's uh, probably one of the, um, the biggest uh, advantage when it comes to uh, the pre-recorded exams that we actually not press for time because back in the days when we we're doing uh, conducting live exams, I think it can be quite pressed for time. And then uh, sometimes uh, after a couple of candidates, you might think back, oh, I should have said, uh, we should have added a couple of words for that candidate and things like that. Yeah, because uh, when you're in that, um, that zone, when you have a candidate one after another, it can be quite uh, stressful, I think. Mm. Yeah, and we're, we've got a question for Jane about that, but I'll stay on the online exams for a second. So, uh, Mark, do you mark them all in one go or do you spread them out over the day or just whenever you have time? I definitely don't mark lots of exams in a row. Um, I tend to mark one or two and then I would have, I would do something, I wouldn't do a whole stretch of about 10 or anything like that. No, I, would, I simply do, um, uh, in, in small batches, one or two at a time. So as for the same reason that Peter says, really, the beauty of an online exam is that you are able to just spend the time that you need to consider how you're going to report back on that exam and make sure that you are sending something back to the candidate that is going to make them feel good about themselves and make them want to progress further and give them some help and support in doing that, really. And Peter? Uh, uh, as you know, like um, Cumbria exams, uh, uh, we're actually quite um, uh, <clears throat> popular for its the quick turnaround time. So um, all examiners are actually expected to uh, complete the exam marking in five working days. So I tend to mark them um, mostly in one go. So like, um, but as I know, um, uh, we do have the admin team that will cross-check the exams before they get sent off to the candidates. So um, I'm actually not too worried in terms of the, um, so because I know that someone will be there to cross-check and to double-check before it gets sent off. And I think for, uh, because come back in the days when I was a student, I think uh, we were always, you know, like um, all students and um, pa uh, parents, as well as the teachers, we're always waiting for the exam results. And I think uh, the quicker that you have for them, I think it's a, uh, it's a great customer service and it's a great um, examination um, experience. I think that really adds to it. And I'm um, still on online exams for, um, and back to Mark, um, what's your pre-exam routine before you sit down and mark an exam? Well, now you see, <laughs> I wish I had one. Um, I don't actually have a complete routine. That's not how I, it's not how I, I operate. As I say, things are very, uh, everything I'm doing is very different. I'm moving from one thing to another very quickly. Um, and so I just, as I say, really want to have a bit of space to mark that exam. So I tend to do it after I've had a bit of a break. And it's, uh, it's that break wouldn't necessarily be routinized, but it might be include, um, you know, a nice cup of tea. And, um, and, and generally just getting myself feeling relaxed and, and uh, happy. in the Because I think actually that's a terribly important thing um, and they're very noticeable, actually, as chief examiner, I can tell you that it's very noticeable that people's mood when they're examining comes out in their in mark sheet. And it's terribly important that you are in the right frame of mind to mark, because even though you 
you know, we're all the same. We're human. We, we write as, as, as things feel right to us at that moment. And our whole concept of what feels right does change as our mood changes. So I think, you know, if I'm in a, a pretty grumpy mood, I wouldn't do any marking of exams. Let's put it like that. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and if my mind's on, if something's gone wrong or there's been a problem, I wouldn't want to make that candidate suffer, if you like, for my lack of focus uh, because of that. So, yeah, I think it's just being in the right frame, okay, making sure I'm in, a, in the right mood, really, and frame of mind to, to do a really positive and enjoyable job. Because I love it, actually. It's great fun. It's great fun. I think Peter would agree. I mean, marking it online, it's just fun, really. You, you've got this wonderful thing. You can listen to it. You can, if you have to listen to something again, you can listen to it again. If you thought you weren't sure. You know, it's great. It's a nice experience. And um, so it, if you're feeling happy and doing it, it's, it, the whole thing becomes just fun, really, and enjoyable. Peter? Definitely. I agree with Mark as well. I think to be in that right state of mind, I think it's what he's saying. And I think it's so important. Uh, I'll probably just add um, in terms of, um, I think, from the more uh, technical aspect of um, examining. I think nowadays, not as much. I think back when I first started online examination or uh, um, life exam, I'll probably prepare myself. I, I remember I used to prepare myself a folder of exam reports for I've examined previously. So something that's to, to be just in the right benchmarking. I think um, uh, I'd like to talk about benchmark because um, back in the days with life exams, I think I found that a lot of um, the benchmarking depends very much on the batch of kids on that day. So you will compare with the candidate in early in the morning and then afternoon and then or later at night. And then you compare, oh, I give that uh, boy a B plus or this boy is better or so that he probably deserves an A. But I think when it comes to online examinations, um, I think that's the best part. I think when it comes to benchmarking, when you're not pressed for time, I think you can think back and you can uh, probably refer to um, different uh, candidates, uh, probably someone that you marked last week or something so that you have a, a, a more of a, uh, let's say, uh, closer, um, accurate benchmarking, I, I would say, yeah. Well, I think you, you oh, I started speaking, I was still muted. I think you guys have actually really set, really well segued into a question that I was going to ask later, but I'll ask it now. So Jane, live examining, you don't have this, oh, we lost Mark. Oh, wait, we've got to put Mark back. Can somebody spotlight him again? I, th I think I can. Ads are oh, great. Um, so, oh, <laughs> okay. I think we're probably all adding him at the same time. Very good. Okay. Um, so, um, Jane. So, yes. So, you're examining and you've had to fail someone. How do you segue from this student to not let that mark affect your next one? Okay, you're assuming that I will do the marking first, but examiners are trained to compare students against certain criteria. And the criteria that we examine against will then determine the mark at the end. So very young and experienced examiners tend to hear and then in the first 10 to 15 seconds think oh that's an A, that's a B and then spend the rest of the time listening for those criteria to um, essentially you know defend their initial impression if you like but as you become more experienced over time you realize that um, the criteria are the ones that you're examining against will determine what the result will be. So we all have, all the different examining bodies actually have very similar criteria. Is there fluency? Is there accuracy? Is the character or the personality of the work um, maintaining stylistic integrity? All of those bits and pieces. H however many of those are achieved within a, sp a specific piece will then determine that whether that that piece is considered an A performance, an A plus, a B or a C and so on. So while I get very upset 
and I very reluctantly will fail. It, it really has to be terrible for me to fail someone because I really don't believe that failing a student is productive in any way, shape or form. Um, the only time I'll probably fail someone is if they can't actually play the piece, you know, and you'd be horrified what some people actually present and think is a minimum appropriate uh, level. So there are, I'm not saying that you don't ever fail, but it's really an examiner's last choice. So if you have had to fail somebody and it's really clear, frankly, anyone that comes after that is a joy. So it's really not that difficult because we don't want to fail kids or students or adults. We want to be as encouraging and positively critiquing for them to enjoy the experience as much as we can. Maybe I'll ask my question a different way. What if something terrible went wrong? The child threw a, the elder student threw a meltdown or... or um, well, I've had kids... Nasty, well, how would you recalibrate before the next exam? Um... Initially, when you in, again, in, it's a question of experience. I think after you've been teaching for, and it, especially also if you have had children of your own, they big. They you get this Teflon exterior that you know it doesn't really affect you personally. What I I find difficult is when I've had one one teacher's students one after the other and there are five or 10 or 15 candidates. And there's this overall issue from start to finish, particularly best example I can give you is that there was one particular studio that I went to and I taught or uh, examined all day and the um, piano was tuned to concert B. However, the students were playing backings and accompanied at concert pitch. And so when they were playing with everything, it was all at minus seconds the entire day. And it, it was, a real challenge to try and find a way to positively encourage the kids while at the same time telling the teacher like seriously <laughs> so it's those sorts of things that examiners tend to struggle more with is not so much the candidate but when a teacher has not read the syllabus and has enrolled the candidate in the wrong grade and you are required to mark them at the grade they've been enrolled in. You know, it's those sorts of situations that make it really, really difficult, but it's not that hard to switch. It's actually a relief to switch from Ugh, to, oh, thank God, who's next, you know? And, and what, I'll ask you the same question. So before your day starts, what do you do to, to psych yourself up and to prepare mentally? I actually prepare my reports the day before. So I go through the reports and I decide what technical work will I be asking, what are the questions I'll be asking. I mean, I've got a pretty much a process. Um, but you know, we have an option as to what oral tests we're going to choose to ask in the site reading. And in all seriousness, I change that around because I get bored. So it's not really to test the students so much as to provide a bit of variety for me. If I'm examining 25 grade two candidates in a row, then I will mix it up a little bit, you know, as in I'll ask them one set of, of technical work and another set and another set, just again, to, to provide some variety for myself. Um, as far as the other preparation is concerned, I do my best to have a good night's sleep. I do my best to have a good breakfast so I'm not grumpy and have two or three coffees and have no, you know, just just be ready to listen. So my prep is, my reports are ready to go. Um, I've checked all the details. I know the order. Um, if there's anything that I'm not feeling well, take my Panadol, whatever it is, so that I'm in the right frame of mind to give the best possible result. And one more for you, Jane, before we go to an everyone question. What do you do to put the, exam, the, the candidate at ease when they enter your exam room? Now, that's a really hard one. It's really difficult because it depends. There's a whole bunch of cultural issues. So depending on what country the student is from, and in a, in a country like ours where we are very multicultural, um, there are certain cultures that don't like formality or expect formality, don't like 
certain behaviors don't want you too close to them do want you to greet them it's it's a real it's a really tricky one so generally what I do is I take um, because they they come into the room and they're escorted in generally by either the teacher if it's at the teacher's house or they're escorted in by a supervisor I'll take my cue from the, ch the child from the student so for the older ones I tend to keep my distance because they really don't want me breathing down their neck they don't want me too close um, but I'll you know greet them and hello and how are you and but the, I think the most important thing is I remind them that I'm looking forward to hearing them play and that I'm going to write wonderful things about them and maybe a couple of suggestions on what to improve if I ask them to do something and they're not sure they're not being tricked they're not being tested on being tricked so please just tell me and I'll rephrase the question because the language I use might be a bit different to what you're used to hearing and by which time you know they try and get a smile from them before we start and then we go that's a really good point no matter what board you're doing if it's face-to-face -face exams firstly the examiner's a human but secondly it's okay to say I'm sorry could you repeat your question in a different way so that I can understand it one of my students in an ABRSM exam was asked in her um, in the general knowledge section um, the oral section sorry was asked something and she answered and the examiner said are you sure and at that mm. moment she said to him because you asked this question I'm not sure anymore now straight away he went no stick with your answer you were right so he was wanting her to justify her answer and she didn't interpret his question correctly so he straight away corrected himself exactly make her feel intimidated so it's always okay to say can you please repeat that I don't understand it um, so so yes but at now, the end that at the end as well is just as important how you how they leave okay because uh, with the video you can't there's nothing you can do they don't see you there's no interaction but particularly if they've had what they think is a terrible experience and they're sure they've failed and kids will tell you that sometimes oh I was just terrible I'm so sorry I don't normally play like this it's always better at home you know that these little things just blurt out sometimes um, I can't tell them the result but what I can do is let them leave knowing that you know what go and tell mum that you need you deserve an ice cream you were great today just let them go with a smile that I can't tell you what you got I can't tell you whether you failed or not but I can let you know that I recognize that you did your best so it the two ends of it are, are just as important face to face thanks Jane now my the, the circles changed on the screen so Jane will get <laughs> so maybe zoom did this intentionally to give us a chance to mix it up a bit so the next question is as for everyone, do you refer to the criteria when you're examining or have you done so many that you just know the criteria now? So Jane. Oh, I've done so many that I know the criteria, but I refer to it every single time. Um, just to ensure that I'm as equitable as I can be. And Amy B spends a lot of time and money training examiners. We do a lot of mock exams together to try and get <laughs> not that we always succeed but we aim for and we strive for it shouldn't matter which examiner you get that you will have be marked against the same criteria and to a certain extent perhaps have certain comments come across you know in common use if that makes sense so we all do share what's a good way of saying this or can you think of a better way of saying this and, and good tip um, I came across what's it called a paraphrase iBot online where I can punch in one sentence and it'll give me five different versions of the same thing so that I'm not <laughs> repeating myself uh, particularly from a teacher's point of view or for siblings you know they come in and they're playing the same thing and you want to encourage them but you can't say the same thing twice especially especially when they're A's or distinctions because you know you were fantastic how many times how many different ways can you actually say that yeah Jane and Peter 
Yeah, definitely from memory, I'll say. Yeah, I think um, I think it's been quite a while since um, we sort of last checked what the criteria are. I think as long as the examiners, I think as long as they kept their teaching uh, practice going, and I think it's always with them. I think it, it is. I think it's so important and crucial that um, examiners are teachers. Um, are full, uh, well, whether they're full time or part time, that but they're actually keeping up their teaching uh, practice. I think that's the most important um, part in this because when you're in in the teaching practice, I think that's when you actually know and you have the compassion. You can have that understanding of what it takes for the candidates to achieve certain level, to achieve a certain um, particular set of skills, or you know what it takes. And I think that's uh, what, when it comes to the assessing um, a performance that you actually acknowledge those work that's done by the, um, it's a it's a co-work between the teacher as well as the candidate. And uh, so, so I think that's very important. I think there are times where, um, uh, back in uh, <clears throat> when we submit um, exams for different examinations board, if there are examiners who do not do any teaching anymore, I think they could be um, uh, a little bit on the hard side, a harsh side in terms of their criteria, because a lot of the time they probably be comparing uh, the candidate's performance to a professional performance, for example, I think that would be very, very different. So I think it's the most important thing in, when it comes to this point, I say is that the examiners they themselves actually keeping up their teaching practice at all times, yeah. Thanks, Peter and Mark. Yeah, that's a, a really interesting answer, Peter, actually, because um, uh, I, I, there's part of that I really agree with, um, but the, just to say slightly differently for me, um, we have very detailed marking criteria and it, we regard it as highly important that the examiners do regularly refer to those marking criteria because it is, as Jane says, really important that we get this consistency across all the different examiners. And it's quite difficult for MTB in some ways, actually, because we're marking different examiners are only marking one instrument. So we need to make sure that consistency is, is good across all instruments to make sure that, you know, a flute player is not disadvantaged from a, a trumpet player. Um, but that's where I totally agree with Peter in that actually because you are an experienced teacher, you do understand that the marking criteria, which are the same in terms of words in a way for grade two as they are for grade eight, have a very different meaning. And unless you understand what that meaning is from your experience of working with grade two candidates and grade eight candidates, what you should expect from tone quality, from articulation and from phrasing and all the rest of it, um, you're not going to be able to apply those marking criteria in a meaningful way. So um, yeah, so my answer is a bit of a mixture uh, in that sense, yeah. Yeah, I think the criteria is more like a guideline. And then I think uh, how you interpret those, I think it's very important. So I definitely agree with Mark. Thanks everyone. And now, um, often it comes up in the forum, does um, the does what you wear affect your marks? So Jane, um, what do you think about how, how does how someone dresses affect their mark? We're human. And the idea that our, it, our students, uh, uh, sorry, our candidates are taking this performance a little more seriously than other candidates certainly will affect you in some way. I don't know that it'll affect the mark as such, but I live in Queensland and when I examine at the Gold Coast, I'm excited if the, the candidate arrives wearing shoes. So it's also a question of degree because a lot of candidates will come, the older ones who are driving, they'll come in their bikinis and board shorts and put the surfboard down and play and then see you going to the beach. And that's, that's, that's how it is. Life in Queensland is very much a, you know, a sporty based thing. And the closer you get to summer, because don't forget we have um, probably 36 weeks a year of summer like weather and people do take advantage of that. By the same token, I've also had candidates arrive with flashing bow ties and sparkly dresses and, you know, it, especially the young ones, um, they love dressing up. So as an examiner, yes, in a tiny, tiny little way, but overall, technically, no, because what we're examining is the performance on from a musical perspective. And from an equitable point of view, not everyone can afford to have nice shoes and clothes. 
and there's cultural issues you know is a young woman a teenage girl who is wearing a dress that really should be just a top are you going to be you know there's also things like that where for the male examiners too it can get quite uncomfortable depending on what some of these kids are wearing and they think is appropriate wear so we have to be yeah it's 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 a tricky one and then there's always the, the sub there's a subconscious element and whenever I'm asked this question on the forum I always say there is a subconscious element that is not marked in the criteria that you that the way you dress will affect how someone perceives you or how you look affects how someone perceives you whether or not that's fair or yes or not. you try for it not to absolutely you try for it not to but there's no question that that a candidate who comes in full of tattoos and facial piercings and maybe the odd horn or something you're just going to just stop for a minute and just remind yourself that maybe you need to be just listening you know uh, <laughs> we're human and we all have our own preferences possibly biases but we do try really hard not to make that part of the process yeah, thanks Jane. Peter well it's a very interesting question and I think um, definitely we are we are marking the um, candidates on their ability on their musicality the whole lot but because this is a uh, what do we say it's a performance um, assessment so we actually look at a lot of this is uh, we look at it as a whole package. I think um, a lot of when you're assessing a performance or performing art, I think a lot of it is impression work. Uh, like uh, I, I think it comes from um, uh, what Mark was mentioning before, like the examiner need to be in the right state of mind uh, and mood and the candidates themselves as well. And with how they come into the exam, how they, um, let's say, convey their attitude towards um, their, and, and their level of preparation, of course. And I think these can are all little areas that can add to, let's say, little bonus points, let's say. They probably, they, they won't uh, contribute to a fail or a pass, but then um, I think these are all the little, probably icing on cake as such. And I think uh, it's always great um, because if you, um, you know, like there are candidates who dress up, you know, who actually dress up, uh, really, really dress up for it you know tuxedos and little things and or like a, if they're playing harry potter dress up as a, a you know with the costumes and things i think it's great i think um because it's performing art as a whole i think it's uh, we look at it as a whole package um but having said that if you can't afford um, a good costume but if you actually deliver your performance very well i don't think it's gonna um uh, lower your mark uh, examiners will lower your mark for it yeah so i think it's a uh, it's something that's a uh, very um very interesting and then uh, but definitely i i I'm definitely very supportive of um, if whenever you can dress up, go that extra mile and then um, go for it. Thanks, Peter. Mark. Yeah, actually, very interesting question. I think that's a very good question. Um, the, uh, the first um, thing I'll say from a from a candidate perspective, if I was myself taking an exam, I think I'd be a bit aware that the, the examiner is going to form an impression of you, if you're in a face-to-face -face exam, probably mostly, um, if you're if you're going to form an impression of you when you go through that door, even be, without wanting to, uh, it's just human nature that we are we just unfortunately make almost ir irrational judgments about people just from the way that they appear, which is wrong. Um, so I would go in with the intention of not doing anything that would, in that way compromise their expectations of me I, I would want to show them that I do care about this what I'm doing here so that's just how I would treat it myself but I I, I you know so that's from a candid perspective as an examiner we are in a slightly unusual position at MTB because we do both effectively a face-to-face -face exam and effectively an online performance exam because our although all our exams are online uh, we have practical exams which include all the technical musicianship sections exactly as you'd expect um, and we have a performance grade and a performance grade is as peter was saying very much a performance and so for the practical grades no dress does not affect the mark that's a simple answer to the question it's what we're hearing from the candidate technically that's not on the criteria and it wouldn't affect a uh, marking um, unless the examiner as jane says somehow was upset by something they were seeing but i think i think um you know i think on the whole um you would ignore the dress in that situation however for a performance grade 
it is a very important part of the exam and it is assessed, it is on the marking criteria, how you present yourself. And if you were doing a concert, you would present yourself in a certain way. In other words, you'd show, you'd make a, that doesn't mean you have to wear DJs and all the rest, you know, dinner jackets and all the rest of it. It can, it can actually be your, your more stylish stuff that you, for your appropriateness, if you like, of what you're doing. But nevertheless, it does matter to the examiner in that situation that you have made an effort to put on a performance and therefore part of that performance, as Peter said, is how you present yourself. And I personally would therefore take that into account in a performance grade. Thanks. Now, I just noticed we've clicked over an hour. Are you happy to keep going? Um, is everyone happy to keep going? This is, this is great. And uh, you know, as we we're talking about this, I thought about, well, how are we all dressed? Well, Peter's dressed very smartly and gives the 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 very CEO appearance and then I'm frightened about what you're going to say there. Second there with his 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 smart jacket and then Jane and I look like we've just finished a day of teaching <laughs> and, and so um even in this room there's a there's a there's a dynamic difference in how we've all, all come to the to the meeting so if you're happy to continue um if anyone does need to leave because uh, the time is up you can watch it again on the live stream um later so um okay now when okay so the next question is do you have a pet hate when when a candidate does something or is there a pet hate that you have jane i've got to think about that one um no not really uh Probably the, the one thing that I do that drives me insane is fingernails tapping on the piano keys. So when you have the most beautiful manicured long claws, I will comment on that because, um, and it'll be something along the lines of, um, I was unaware that the composer included a percussive element to the performance. You know, it'll be something ridiculous like that because I'm sure that the teacher will have said something about long fingernails. I'll also point out something along the lines of, you know, how it's interfering with correct posture and facilitating um, a, a wider range of tone that was then was achieved or something along those lines. But yeah, fingernails. Oh, it drives me crazy, especially if I can hear it. If I don't hear it, then I can sort of live with it. But yes, fingernails. I should have said when I was thinking this question, I wasn't thinking of something that necessarily affected the mark. I think one of my pet hates, um, particularly in the Facebook forum, is um, illegal photocopying. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> when I see a student is carrying illegal photocopies, I'm like, oh my goodness. There is nothing more. Um, that frustrates me because I am a composer and I have candidates who've come along with a photocopy of my composition without even purchasing a legal copy and yeah I can't help myself I will mention that but Amy B do have a um, in the policy is that uh, photocopies are not to be brought into the candidate into the examination room but it will not affect the mark because at the end of the day um, how a student acquires uh, a sheet of music nine times out of ten is due to a teacher not themselves and so penalizing a student for having an illegal copy I don't think is a fair and equitable thing even though I will mention it though on page such and such of the syllabus please note the general requirements that you know um, you're not to use photocopies but it's just it's just wrong it really is wrong as professionals to take away the income of other professionals it's just wrong it's not ethically appropriate so no I won't mark them down I can't um, but if I could maybe I would especially for mine <laughs> Thanks, Jay. what about you Peter do you have a pet hate uh, I don't think there's anything in particular I think if anything I'll just say uh, probably uh, you know after a long day of examining I think um, if just uh, students presenting long pieces and then that are underprepared, I think that can be quite um, just a 
quite tiring and frustrating uh, <laughs> to listen to because you want to do your best, you still want to go through, and then you're thinking, poor kid, why haven't you prepared this, um, play this more fluently, or and then the pace is long, and then it, it's not right, but then you want to do your best at the same time, so that's the sort of the dilemma. <laughs> yes, but nothing in particular, no. Mark? Yeah, uh, a difficult question. I think I sort of agree with Peter there. It's just if you hear a pupil that's just not really prepared, it's just a bit frustrating, really, as an examiner, that you can't, uh, you're, they're making your life quite hard to help them, really. Um, yeah, nothing more than that, I don't think. I might diverge from my, my list of questions because Jing asked a question in the chat. And then particularly for Peter and Mark now, and that is when you're doing a recorded exam, um, are examiners expected to listen to it only once or are they listening to it multiple times? So Peter. Well, I think um, the best thing when it comes to online exams so with um, Combra exams, I think it's uh, when, when we have our own assessment system portal, and then that's when we can actually uh, go in and actually review the um, um, the particular spots uh, where we would like to make a mention. And then so there are spots that we will go, uh, examiners will always go back and actually make um, probably comments on at one minute, 34 seconds, and this particular spot at uh, your left hand is incorrect, or you should actually, um, the rhythm isn't quite uh, um, on, on time or things like this. And I think that's uh, that's one of the, uh, let's say, I'd say the, um, the best uh, benefits when it comes to um, online exams that you can actually go back and actually re revise and probably uh, rephrase your comments uh, in a more constructive um, criticism. I think that's, that's very important. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, before asking Mark, in this room at the moment, I have the dog, the cat, and two children sleeping. So we've had to mute because the dog's snoring so loud. But at this very moment, my second son decided to start yelling at my other son to go and turn off the PowerPoint somewhere um, in his sleep. So I'm very sorry for the, the cracking up laughter. He's, he's very determined that we need to turn the PowerPoint off somewhere. Anyway, so, um, yes. So sorry. <laughs> I wasn't laughing at you, Peter. Um, <laughs> and now, Mark, <laughs> well, I forgot what the question was. What was the question? Oh, do we you listen? listen to the recording multiple times? Yeah, no, I agree with Peter totally here. The advantage of an online exam is that as an examiner, you know, it's with the best one in the world, you're, you're, you, you might think, hang on, did I actually listen to that exactly as I want to? You might go back and listen to it again to make sure you actually did hear uh, the dynamic changes you're expected to hear or whatever it is and and uh, yeah so I think it's a it just makes the whole examining process so much easier if I'm honest with you that you can do that so yes we definitely do and sometimes the first impression is not quite right like you might hear something and think oh that play, student's playing with wrong rhythm and then when you hear the second time you go oh wait a second the rhythm was right the accent accentuation mm. was incorrect so um yes i I, th I know that there um some boards have a policy of not w listening more than once i've heard that uh, jane is saying amy b has that policy that they only listen once so that it's equivalent to a live exam um so the, i guess the answer to jing is it does depend on the board whether or not but it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing either way is, is what what we're coming to um okay so now um my next thing was when you are listening to an exam what's the very first thing that you notice jane it depends on whether we're talking about technical work the pieces the oral section okay so for the purposes of tonight let's work on pieces because that's probably the most common format um it depends on the piece because we get given a candidate slip which tells us the program, what's the student going to play and 99.999% of the time the examiner will know the piece because it's come from the syllabus and or the books or the series or whatever. Very occasionally it'll, you know, you'll come across a piece you, you are unfamiliar with um, in which case it, for Amy B certainly it's um, expected that the a copy is given to the examiner and by the way in that circumstance a photocopy is fine um, because the candidate is expected to bring the original in 
to the room with them for their own purposes. So in that case, yes, or for, or for page turning, it's okay to have make a photocopy and attach it to the original. The point is the original. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that I have a good answer for that one, sorry. All good. As I, some of the questions are a bit far afield. Yes. There is there's something that the first thing that grabs your attention when you're yeah if for me if anything it's probably um, the first that that three or four seconds of okay I'm just going to count myself in and start because a lot of candidates just start and then the tempo varies widely as they settle in they think oh my god I started too fast and I'll slow down or or the reverse or whatever or <laughs> my favorite I'm in the wrong key or I'm in the wrong register or <laughs> oh hang on can I start again you know all those false starts false starts for me um, detract from the preparedness of the performance so it's that first few seconds I think is really really important and for the same reason the last few seconds where they finish and they pause and then they relax as opposed to <laughs> at the end it's again it's part of that that performance etiquette and what's appropriate and Peter uh, yeah, as you know, uh, Cumberly exam is an online exam, so submitted videos. So I'll say the first thing that I notice when it comes to a performance, I'll say there's the quality of the submitted video, uh, the clarity of sound, the clarity of video, uh, the image, and of course, plus uh, back to what, what we talked about, the way they dress and how, uh, because I'm a piano examiner, how the piano is showcased. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> there, there's, um, there are candidates who present on the keyboard. There are uh, uh, candidates that present on a, a proper digital piano beautifully. And then there are, um, uh, I think, because it's an online exam, I think just the, even the choice of angle that how they um, shoot the actual video is actually quite in, important too. Like um, how visible is the um, uh, is the examiner able to see? Um, yeah, the, the finger work as well as the pedaling. You see, so so it's the whole lot. I think I think it's a whole package, and that's the first impression. And I think um, given the technology nowadays, um, I think. Uh, just with a little bit more effort, I think all candidates should be able to uh, submit a uh, video of quite a high standard, you know, like uh, even our uh, smartphones nowadays can record really good quality image as well as um, audio. So I think um, if you just spend a little bit more time and to get all those things in place, you know, the lighting uh, of the video, it's, it's a whole package. And I think that can really make a whole, just the whole experience because it's not just the um, student's experience of playing through the uh, the examination, but it's also the experience that the uh, the examiner is actually listening through. Yeah, I think that's a very important experience too. Thanks, Peter. Mark? Yeah, and um, well, I mean, one of the things that comes across very quickly when you're marking a brass exam is, is the technique. You, you, you immediately um, hear uh, a lot from the very start of an exam about uh, the technical side of someone's playing. Even from the first few notes, you begin to get a feel for whether somebody is actually playing to a certain standard technically. Um, I know that sounds a bit odd if you're not a trumpet player, but it's very much the case with the brass instrument. Um, but um, I think the other thing is a bit like what Jay was saying in some ways, that there, you know, a, a pupil sometimes just starts without really breathing or anything before a piece and actually getting yourself slightly into the zone and just actually drawing our attention as the examiner to what you're just about to do by doing that has quite an impact actually if you just and I, I quite often do this myself when I play I look like I'm going to play but I don't actually play I actually wait a good few seconds and then I actually it's a bit like radio when you get silence on radio or something everyone suddenly wakes up because they think, oh, well, has nothing happened? And by not doing anything, you actually wake your own, focus their attention on you, and then you start. I find that that's quite a good way to, to get people listening to you a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Now, um, I, I'll, I'll go to another question from the chat, and that's um, Claire has asked about um, f with the um, examining students with um, who are using adapted instruments, um, uh, what she's asking, what steps uh, are you taking to ensure that the examiners fully understand the the effects of um, doing an exam on an adapted instrument? 
um, it's a di difficult question. So adapted instrument, I'll just um, clarify. For instance, a clarinet that's only played with one hand because the student only has one hand. Um, so it may be a bit of a tricky question to answer, but Jane. In piano world, it's very unusual to have a candidate arrive who doesn't have both hands or but I have examined and had and taught students who perhaps have had maybe one finger on one limb and a full range. Um, it's much more common to have students who are uh, who have nonverbal learning disorder or autism, Asperger's and the whole the whole range if you like the the um, alphabet soup as we call it of a whole range of issues but then there's also I've had um, blind students, students with cochlear implants, you know, the, the list just goes on and on and on. At the end of the day, a reasonable um, scaffolding is something that we, we generally are told face to face that the student or the candidate has this particular disability and is going to require these accommodations, in which case we take that into account. Um, at the end of the day, though, it is an examination on how musical is the work being presented. So there's this real balance between giving an equitable uh, assessment while at the same time taking into account limitations that the candidate may never be. For example, if they don't have a leg, they're hardly going to be able to use the pedal. You know, it's you've got to be sensible. Um, so I think the actual answer is exam boards will always defer to giving the best possible result while at the same time not devaluing what an A actually means. Thanks Jane. Peter? Yes, um, I think um, like Jane was saying, I think it's uh, less likely in the piano world, but I think um, uh, as at Combrio exams, uh, when students submit their exam, there are special requests, special, let's say, um, notes that um, the candidates or the parents, they can actually include. I think what's important is a uh, close communication. If there are kids with special needs or if there's anything that needs to be addressed, I think as long as it's communicated prior to the exam, I think that's very, uh, that, I think as all examiners, I think we're there to help. We're trying to see what the candidates can do rather than what they can't do. And I think that's very important and I think um, but at the end of the day we are marking music on in itself so like the continuity of the music the musicality of the music uh, rather than you know like I think uh, the closest I can think of is uh, when kids you know like well uh, younger age kids when they need a ped pedal extender just make sure that you know uh, if you make sure that's all in the right spot and it doesn't uh, provide uh, if it doesn't create any squeaks or like noises um, that distracts the, um, the actual playing or distracts the actual music that's fine you know go for it and I think um, we all talk about what the, um, the music that's being generated at the end yeah and I think it's a challenge even like playing a particular instrument and lots of the instruments I play are ones that, that um, will be discussed in a couple of weeks when we have someone from OHMI coming to speak about adapted instruments specifically and inclusive education that um, I have no idea how to play an adapted instrument because I've never touched one. Um, but I would... So I wouldn't actually know if I heard someone play, what are the difficulties? But, so I couldn't really examine or talk about that, but I could hear how, I'd just be amazed at how well they have managed on an instrument that may, is probably more difficult than the equivalent on a, on a um, if, if for somebody who doesn't have an upper limb difference. So, but yeah. So I don't think even playing those instruments, I would know how an adapted instrument works. I personally had to have an adapted mechanism on my arm, and I'm pretty sure that the examiner gave me an A plus before I started playing, just by the fact that I was actually willing to play despite having no movement. So, um, but um, yeah, so I think I felt when I had no movement that the examiners, if for Amy, they were very understanding and very compassionate to the fact that I actually had no movement in my hand and yet I was still trying to pursue um, doing exams. In, in the end, they told me the reason I got movement back was probably the fact that I kept playing and, and didn't let that stop me. 
because they didn't think I would. But anyway, that's another story. Um, but yes, we will um, def- have in the couple of weeks for, to whet everyone's appetite, um, Rachel from OHMI coming to speak. So sorry, um, to intervene, Mark, adapted instruments. Yeah, we, we have a particular process for this. I mean, the point is it, we have what's called a reasonable adjustments process, basically. And what it means is that if you are going to be using a, a, an adapted instrument, you need to tell us beforehand because of the very reasons that you mentioned, Sarah, that um, we need to make sure the examiners are furnished with the information as to what that instrument is capable of. In some cases, it actually can't do certain things or it makes certain things more difficult to achieve um, or it can make certain things slightly easier to achieve. So it's good to know these things. So we do a bit of research on uh, directly with them as to what what it, the implications of that are, and then that is taken into account basically uh, in the way you mark the exam. Thank you, Mark. Now, um, I, the next question I have is: um, How important do you personally feel that correct technique and posture are in a candidate, Jane? Um, okay, it depends on the standard and the level. So the lower the grade, the less likely it is that there'll be as clear mastery, perhaps, of those levels as you go. Um, I will always encourage exceptional posture and a relaxed, comfortable seating position with the feet flat on the floor. And I will comment on, you know, your elbows perhaps are too close and too low or you know whatever um, but at the end of the day the posture needs to facilitate the playing and if you've got a lanky 19 year old who's a string bean and he's choosing to cross his legs and sit like this and he's got fingers out to here but it still sounds fabulous <laughs> you know I think the physical part of um, the physique of the student or the candidate really does play a part so as a small person I'm five foot two and a half that half is very important um, I, I, I'm, I spend a lot of time explaining to my students that for me to get a big fat sound I have to use my body weight because I'm not as strong in my upper body as a male would be and so you know it's not a great difference but it is a, a factor so if I'm sitting correctly I can lean in just a little and add the weight of my body to the sound that I'm trying to produce whereas um, my six foot two can you know students um, the male ones they they're having trouble popping the knees under the keyboard and so that presents its own set of challenges of accessing this you know the, the pedal so I know I'm going in a very long-winded way about it but it's really important you can't ignore the physicality of the candidate so in an ideal world where none of that matters but it does um, then posture is in certainly on piano is the beginning and it starts from the feet and I think a lot of teachers don't understand that so they spend all their time curl over your fingers which creates all this tension and the feet are dangling and what the students trying to do is balance on this bench whereas if the feet are nice and flat and leaning forward from the center of gravity and the elbows are out a little bit, all of a sudden you've got this release of tension, which is what good technique is all about. Does that make sense? Um, so beyond that, um, yeah, posture, 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 posture. And then from there we work on correct posture with technique and scales and whatever. And then from there we build. Thank Peter. Well, this is a big question. <laughs> As a music educator, I believe this is definitely very important to have the correct technique, posture in a candidate. But as the old saying, all roads leads to Rome. At Combrio, examiners are, not, are told not to comment specifically in terms of the correctness of their technique. I mean, we can talk about it in terms of how insufficient technique would lead to poor fluency, rhythm, wrong notes, no accuracy, intonation, the whole lot. But we do need to respect the different 
technical approach from the various schools around the world, schools of piano playing. I mean, there's always that uh, uh, the candidates can always, you know, bring up, oh, Horowitz play with flat fingers, you know, how can you tell me to curve the fingers, you know, uh, there's different ways, you know, there's the French school, there's the Chinese school, they were very highly lifted fingers, as long as they can deliver a competent performance, I think we need to acknowledge that. And then, but I think um, we can comment on this, uh, in terms of the music, uh, in terms of anything that needs, um, that has the weakness and then that actually needs further strengthening. But I, I don't think we can actually comment on the actual correctness because this actually goes down really far, yeah. And before before I pass to Mark, I'll mention that M Michel Dubois, the flautist, he used to joke his embouchure was so bad that he was used by lecturers as an example of what not to do. However, he very successfully did it. So, um, and Moyes, it looks like he's got a space in his mouth for his his smoking pipe. So, you, you know, the, a lot of very well-known musicians have used non-ideal technique. Um, right. Anyway, Mark. Yeah, no, I, I, I do agree with a lot of what's been said by uh, Jane and Peter, actually. Um, it, the reason we have instrument specialist examiners at MTB is because of this very area, really, is um, that technique is, is a vitally important thing to understand from an examiner's perspective. And what, what I would say is that it's, a, it's not that you're looking for good posture and technique. What you're listening to is some music and you're hearing things in that music. And as an experienced player of the particular instrument I play, I do understand why some of the things I'm hearing are not sounding quite as good as they might have sounded if I, if I understood, um, you know, if I understood it, what is it that's causing the articulation to sound really bad? What, what you know, is that good articulation? Is is the is the phrasing working? In other words, is the briefing right? Um, I'm not saying that you would. I totally agree with Peter. You, you don't teach people. You know, you don't uh, launch in and basically say anything that would criticise a teacher. That would be completely wrong. Um, but what you're doing is you're drawing attention to the area that could be worked on to help that stop happening in your performance. Um, so we do actually comment on technique at MTB, but not in a way that would tell you how to do something, but the area in which to uh, work on and what we believe is the cause of your, you know, if you're a string player, the shifts being wrong or the string changing being wrong. If you're a brass player, you know, the articulation, the tone quality, you know, if you've got great tension in your upper body, it's going to have a huge effect on the tone that you, and, and your ability to do certain things. And so you would mention that you can see it straight away. Um, but if somebody comes in and plays like Dizzy Gillespie with a terrible embouchure and and took their grade eight, you wouldn't you wouldn't lower their mark because their embouchure was wrong. That's just wrong. You're hearing great playing, and as Peter says, all roads. I think it was a great way of putting it. Um, you know, uh, if you if it works and what I'm hearing is good, then that that's good it's just if it's not working we can perhaps help you to understand why it's not working i think is what i'm trying to say yeah mark that was that was a very clear answer thank you and summed up what everyone said well done um and now i've, I've already asked jane the question and i've already asked oh jane jane so this is a student preparing for their upcoming live exam um what advice and they're nervous about it. What advice would you give them? So they're preparing for a live exam and they're vomiting nervous, uh, shaking nervous or slightly nervous because there's a really big difference. Let's say shaking. Let's <laughs> Shaking's the most common one. Um, it's really difficult to say in all seriousness because I found, especially this year, with COVID, there are the idea of um, how much does a, an average student have an underlying anxiety condition has actually increased significantly. So the last 12 to 24 months has seen a major shift in um, how comfortable candidates seem to be presenting. For some it's fine, it's been absolutely no issue. but. I've, I've certainly noticed that there seem to be more and more and more students who take longer to settle in, if that makes sense. Um, and you get flashes of, 
oh this is what they could have sounded like but the nerves are just interfering with everything and they have a mental blank and oh, can I start again and all those sorts of things so I that's a, that's a really difficult one to answer because these are unprecedented times um, another really big important factor is that when this candidate is traveling to the exam there's so many things that can actually interfere with what goes wrong if they're stuck in traffic and they're running late and they have to rush and they haven't had time to warm up or my favorite one the stage mother that we all love and adore who brings their child in and is like this you know and don't forget that you know and, and actually winding up this the candidate before they even walk in the door there's so many different different areas all I can say to you is as a teacher um, what I do with my young ones <laughs> I have this whole story that I give them I don't actually tell them they're doing an exam so the story that they get for their very first time is uh, you know I'm a teacher and I'm an examiner and they go yeah they go, do you know what that means no not really I said okay so what happens is um, I need a license to um, test other teachers students and to do that I need to pick six or seven of my best students to go along and do a test on how well I have taught you would you like to be one of those students and look I've been doing this for 30 years right and they all go sure and you get a day off school and mum has to take you to McDonald's oh okay you know and the beauty of doing that is I can swear the parent to secrecy that it's an exam but it's still a performance so all of a sudden the pressure's off the candidate it's on me because they're representing me and they're being taught they're being tested on how well I have taught them I've never been caught with this in this outright lie. They are absolutely outraged afterwards when they've done the exam and it, the report comes in and then I say to them, by the way, that was an exam. They go, really? Is that all that was? Why do my friends get so nervous? You know, it's, I try to find creative ways of taking the focus away from them and onto the music. So I also have an entire thing where we do a whole dress rehearsal before the exam and I make it as mean and nasty as I can. I don't smile. I go, is that what you're wearing? Oh, for goodness sake. And I just, you know, I, I will actually just make it a really yucky experience without them, without completely destroying them. Um, and then at the end saying, well, did you survive? Yes. Well, I would give you a B or an A for this if I was examining you. So if you vomit all over the examiner, you're still going to pass love. It'll be fine. They go, oh, okay. So it's, it's a case of, I think, the psychology behind how you send them to a face-to-face -face exam is everything. Um, and the, I guess, sorry, I'll, I'll try and keep it short, but it's a big topic. Um, the, other, the other strategy that I use that I find is really, really effective with AMEB, if I have a minimum of 30, 33 hours of examining, I can have the examiner come to my studio, which is my preference. So I can control the day and the kids are playing on an instrument that they've been having lessons on and they know how it feels and what it looks like. Um, it's a much more relaxed thing than going into the uh, main Amy B office, which is has 25 studios and it's all very officious and all very it's all really groovy. But it's for some kids it can be quite overwhelming that whole conservatorium feel. Um, so you know, I I just sort of have to play it by ear a little bit. But overall, it's knowing that candidate and in a really warm, kind, caring way, controlling how much mum or dad are going to ramp up the anxiety of that student. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Sorry. Now, now, Peter and Mark, so the question I have for you is um, you've, you, I, what advice would you give to a student who is struggling to get the perfect take? So, Peter. I, my advice would be uh, to relax. <laughs> I think um, there will never be a perfect recording and you can only do so much. I say, um, and then usually the more you do, you know, it's just um, the level of quality usually goes down. <laughs> I think um, I say probably get around five to 10 takes from uh, various time of the day and pick your best one. And I think it's to, to, to actually put yourself in that zone that 
it won't be perfect. And then you don't need a perfect recording to get your um, A or A plus score. I think that's very important because uh, our performances aren't perfect. And then I think that that's the, um, I think that that's a very, especially with um, online exams, like, like Cumbria exams, I think a lot of candidates, they're actually just waiting for that perfect one to actually arrive. And then it, it just never happens. And then I think the most important thing is to actually understand you don't have to be perfect and they will never be perfect recording. I think, I think as long as you've done your best and then pick, the, pick your favorite one, and I think it, it, as long as it showcases all your skills, all the things that you've learned, and I think that's enough, I think, um, yeah. Does it have to be in one take? Like yeah, all the pieces? Uh, separate pieces, separate take. Pardon? Separate pieces, uh, separate take. It doesn't have to be one take. Very cool. Amy B, one take, all pieces. Yeah. That 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 creates that's uh, hard. That yes. Very hard. Yes. Yeah. Fuck. Yes. Um, well, just to answer that question, with an MTB exam, everything has to be in one take. Yes. So it's uh, you start the recording at the beginning of the exam and you end it at the end of the exam, which is why very rarely would you do it more than once, actually, because it's a very time-consuming <laughs> process. I've only ever. I mean, I I, I still teach. And I've, uh, I've only ever retaken exams over all the years twice, once, both times a grade seven trumpet pupil whose lip just gave out totally and they were very upset. And I just said, right, we'll do it again. And then we did it next week instead. But, you know, with, with brass particularly, you can't just do it three or four times, it just wouldn't work. It's just, you know, you do. So, so essentially you do it once. And um, with MTB, we use an app, actually, there's an app which you use to record and submit the exam and the way that app works is that, that you record the exam on the app um, and at the end of that recording you decide whether you want to submit that recording or not if you decide that it was just not reflecting your ability and you decide you didn't want to you say no and that recording is deleted so you would then re-record the exam uh, yourself. I mean, it's not deleted straight away. It's only deleted if you decide to redo the exam, is what I'm saying. It's not quite as cruel as that. But basically, essentially, there's only ever one recording on that app of your exam. So it's not like you would choose between the various recordings, slightly different uh, sort of model to, um, to others. But essentially, so you, you, it's a one take exam. And usually, 99%, well, I'd say nine out of 10 times at least, probably 95% more times people will probably present that first uh, recording and then uh, just submit it. Because as Peter says, very often, you're not gonna get a perfect recording. And actually I used to do loads of recording for English GCSE and A-level exams, all done the same way as this, all online uh, recording, you know, submitted online. And um, the pupils would often try and play a piece, their, their little couple of pieces, five times. The first one was almost always the best. Um, you know, it generally only gets worse. So. Uh, trust me, just submit the first one if it's like, if you think you've set a pretty reasonable representation of what you've done, I think that's the best way to go. And then move on. Why otherwise you're just wasting time. Get on with it. Enjoy yourself. Learn some new music. <laughs> well, as a Suzuki teacher, I would actually, I, I, do, I do quite differently. And I start recording them just before they're ready. And then we listen back to the recording and reflect on it. And it doesn't degrade if you work on it before you record again. It's when the students go, oh, let's do another take, let's do another take, and it starts degrading. So I would record over a, a few week period to try and get the best recording that student could get using using it as a tool rather than just the single exam recording. Um, but it, it does depend on which, which board you're using, whether or not that Suzuki model and maybe not all suzuki teachers do it my way but would work and um so that's very interesting to hear what you say mark about mtbs much more like a face-to-face -face exam model than than conbrio which is more like the, the has the possibility of being used more like a suzuki model um, yeah i think i just i might just add uh, to this one i think um the reason why conbrio is you can actually allow um candidate to submit um in separate takes we actually launched um our exam board as an online examination uh, prior to COVID. actually so we're actually looking for 
um, how how well can a candidate actually present one particular piece as a, as a practical so we want to see their best and then of course when we first launched a lot of people asked about oh, what about the um in terms of when how it compares to life exam i think um when it comes to the amb video submission or the mtv i think it's more like a live submitted live exam um, more more like a that, that kind of um concept Do you want to do you want to add, add to add to that, Mark? I'm um, sorry. Did you think I did? Um, oh. uh, I, you no, had I the was, telltale expression. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. I, absolutely not. No, I, I completely understand that. Um, I totally agree that this is the beauty of an online exam. Uh, this is where Peter and I are in total agreement. The beauty of an online exam is you don't want the one thing you want to avoid happening is a pupil going into a room making a what they feel is a fool of themselves and then coming out never wanting to take an exam again in fact never even wanting to play the instrument sometime again and the beauty of an online exam is that it, it has a safeguard to avoid that very problem if you do an exam and you're not happy with what you've done you simply say right let's not present that let's do it when we feel that we are showing what we've we're, we're, we're capable of yeah, thank you. And I might skip my next question just because um, because of the time. Um, so I'll two more questions then. What role do you feel the quality of the instrument used plays in the exam? So Jane. With little people, not a lot. It shouldn't, but it does. It shouldn't. Um, I like the I, I I personally prefer to make sure that my students are playing on a touch sensitive 61 note keyboard if they absolutely have to um, prefer an 88 note rather than a 77 note um, digital piano but ultimately an acoustic piano because I'm teaching piano not keyboard um, so as an examiner when you're in when they come into Amy B, they're all playing on a, on acoustic, upright, good quality, beautifully tuned with pedal extenders, um, you know, Yamaha's or Kawai's, so it's all fine. If I'm examining live at a teacher's studio, nine times out of ten it's good. Occasionally the tuning isn't quite what it should be. Um, the worst being that I've already told you about, uh, and sometimes. Um, because I also do contemporary and piano for leisure, um, the students are actually, the candidates are playing to a backing. So in addition to what they're normally doing with everything else, we've also got to look at the balance between and where the speaker is placed and, and what's the quality of the recording. And is it uh, just a music minus one arrangement so that their part is clearly uh, audible as opposed to um, you know du being duplicated in the piano part that's in the recording so there's all of those issues as well um, the quality of the instrument is only going to affect the mark that we give them if I can't if I can clearly see that they're phrasing and they're trying to sh do staccato and legato and, and you just can't hear it you know and so the higher the grade the more important the quality of the instrument is because you just won't get the the the, the range of tone and control that we need to be able to assess accurately thanks jane peter i think i agree with jane i think i'm um, definitely i think the quality of the uh, instrument and i think i need to be able to showcase the actual uh, capability of the candidate and i think it does add to this sort of um, bonus point to a good performance when there's a good instrument i think there's a um, again like back to what we were um, uh, discussing prior i think there's a good percentage of the score from the music assessment that actually goes to impression work i think um an instrument that is probably in a poor condition or out of tune can definitely affect the quality of the exam. Um, as well, I think more importantly is the actual learning of the candidate. I think um, I think you would definitely want to probably make a mention, um, probably um, tune a piano next time before you actually re uh, make the recording, things like that. Yeah, I think that's very, very important. Uh, it's a slightly different issue for um, piano students versus mm -hmm. um, uh, woodwind brass students. So um, Mark, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, 
the short answer is that it, the quality of the instrument shouldn't affect the mark. That's the aim. Um, but obviously, um, we can only mark what we hear. And, um, you know, if your instrument is inadequate in certain ways, it does affect <laughs> what we hear. We won't actually necessarily know what that is. Um, so it could affect your, uh, your exam if, if you have a poor instrument, but the aim is not to be, we're not marking your, uh, the quality of your instrument, that's for sure. Um, it's just that if what you're using, the equipment you're using doesn't allow you to actually to do what you're actually trying to do, then that in a sense, I suppose, all I can say is that you're, you, you just have to do your best to overcome those those problems but the examiner if they hear an out of tune piano but just going to piano again it's i don't think they're, they're, there's certainly no uh, reflection of that in the result in, uh, of, the, of that exam it's nothing to do with that and on a trumpet uh, uh, it, it is a, as you say different it can easily affect um what we're hearing so they just have to work harder to overcome some of those difficulties i think if they want to achieve what is required to, to pass that particular grade and I, when I was a young teacher, I thought I used to think it didn't matter. And and I've had a student do her diploma, Deepa Vyarasim, on the the bottom of the range Yamaha. But what I came to realise was that the bottom of the range Yamaha was possible to do the Deepa Vyarasim, but it didn't help her. As my thank you helps me do the exam. It gives me good tone easily. It gives me dynamics easily. The mechanism moves without much clunkiness. I don't need to try. There's all these extra things I don't need to try to do. And then if we're going below Yamaha quality um, and or equivalent quality, and, and then we start to get instruments which don't give the octaves at the perfect two to one ratio. And, and so there's intonation issues that are caused by the instrument. When I did viola grade eight, many a year ago i was playing on an enrico which is a real bottom of the range um viola and and i was going i actually couldn't get the dynamic range i wanted to get for grade eight and i went out and bought another viola because at that moment i realized that actually there was a point that the enrico stopped being good enough for an exam because it just didn't give the the sound quality required and the examiner can't mark me on good tone if the instrument doesn't actually produce a good tone and Enrico's are great for what they're for which is for beginners who are more likely to break a violin they're as strong as a cricket bat but when it comes to grade eight it was so strong that it couldn't resonate so I think that's my answer to that question that um the a good quality instrument will help and make it easier whereas a, a lower quality instrument you have to almost fight against but now for my last question because i realize we've been here for a while um the last question is um do you have any pearl of wisdom for someone who's just beginning out their music examination journey jane um to a teacher or a student oh whichever you feel like okay um Hopefully I won't get lynched for this answer. My personal view is that any exam board and any uh, syllabus is not a teaching curriculum. Therefore, you don't have to do every grade and it's not designed for you to do every grade. You as a teacher is, are responsible for coming up with a curriculum that and a broad range of musical experiences that is going to develop a full musician. And an exam is only one part of that experience, a very important part, but is only one part of that experience. And that I don't think it's fair that teachers would expect an exam board to um, be one-stop shopping, so to speak. So it's, I guess the, the best advice I can give is for teachers, don't stop learning. I've been teaching for 35 years and I'm still learning and having fun and working out all these groovy new things. I must say, thank goodness I te te teach teenagers because they teach you all the techie things that scare me. So be open, try new things, think about being perhaps a bit more student led because ultimately as teachers, we succeed when we make ourselves redundant in our students' lives. That's ultimately our goal. As far as students are concerned, all you can do is your best. 
it's really as simple as that. Um, an exam result is a very, no matter how hard we try, is a very subjective opinion of one person in that 10, 20, 30 minute time frame, which may not necessarily represent you as a musician. Um, and again, that comes back to you may well be a fabulous improviser or a composer or a something other than what we are examining you in. So don't feel that you are limited and defined by your exam experience. It's one part of the whole process. Thanks, Jane. Peter, your pearls of wisdom. I think I really like what James said. Oh, that was wonderfully done. <laughs> I think um, my words of wisdom would be, um, I'll probably pick a particular point. I say, uh, pick the pieces that you like to learn. I think life is too short to play pieces that you don't like and be patient. I think this is why at Combrio, we actually designed a whole interactive music syllabus that actually with, um, I think uh, uh, so far I know Trinity uh, has similar idea as well that we can actually have allow candidates to submit their pieces of their choice to be included in the syllabus. And I think that is uh, one very big part, I think uh, in terms of, um, music education that you actually want to learn the piece that you actually enjoy and then you can actually present them for an examination which I, I absolutely love the AMEB piano for leisure syllabus um, um, uh, our school in Sydney is actually a big advocate of the leisure syllabus I think uh, I think when it comes to music I think there's no boundary and I think there's no barrier I think um, you know Beethoven wrote his um, for at least not just uh, he didn't write this and said this is going to be great five you know like I think um, I think it's so important that we actually see this see beyond the actual ex exam framework examination framework and actually understand we're here to learn and actually to be as inclusive as, as we can I think that's um, that's my word of wisdom yeah life is too short to play the pieces that you don't like and I can, I translate from those from the UK. Peter's referring to the Amy B. Piano for Leisure syllabus, which is three pieces and there's there's a lot more freedom in how they're, they're chosen. So their books include a lot of arrangements of modern popular sort of music as well, just for those who aren't familiar with that syllabus. Mark, you get the last word. What's your word of wisdom? <laughs> Well, just to, to uh, just latch on to that little point that was just made there, I couldn't agree more with Peter that playing the music that you enjoy is the key to enabling your pupil to really want to practice. And that's why MTB, just like um, uh, Combrio, um, is completely free choice repertoire is allowed for the entire recital. You just send pieces in if, you, if you're not sure if they're the right grade standard, you send them in for approval from us or if you... If they're already approved uh, by another off core regulated board in the UK, then they're, they're definitely the right standard. But, you know, any piece that you like to play, you can use for your exams. And that's a great start. I totally agree. Uh, it's a big game changer in the whole field, really. Um, but um, what I would like to say, my pearl of wisdom, if I, if, if, if that sounds terribly grand, isn't it? But my pearl of wisdom would be having learned the trumpet when I was a kid and now I've just taken up the cello. Literally, the last few months, I've, someone's given me a cello. I've started to try the cello. And what I've learned is that when I was in far too much of a hurry to get through my grades when I was younger, basically the key to being successful on a brass or on any instrument, I think, is to make sure the foundations are thoroughly in place. Because if you build on good foundations, you will progress very quickly. But, and your, your um, progress will, will go like this. As you progress, if you are uh, trying to move too quickly uh, and you don't build the foundations properly, you will progress like this and then it will plateau because you won't have the technical foundation in place to allow you to develop to the high level that you really aspire in the end. So don't be in too much of a hurry to go for that grade one is my advice. And that's why MTB, just to let you know, we've got two pre-grades, pre-grade introductory, pre-grade higher and that if there are any pre-grades at various things and um, then most boards do have them I would recommend that you make the most of that opportunity to give your pupils a reward for getting to a certain level without making them play stuff that isn't actually appropriate for their level of reading technique 
and and a fundamental yeah I, on the cello i'm still working diligently at my open strings would you believe just to get it right because i realize that now and i never knew that when i was a kid so just make sure you you just take your time to get the fundamentals right wise words mark well um i want to give a very special thank you to um the three of you for joining me tonight and it's been a long night i prepared more questions than i probably should have so um <laughs> and for those who've managed to say the end thank you very much and for those who didn't um there's the live stream um, that you can watch it later assuming it worked that <laughs> my fingers are crossed there it was giving me some funny messages so um if um we can unmute and just give a round of applause to jane from the amy b peter from conbrio and mark from mtb oh no one can unmute <laughs> imagine me clap Oh, sorry, sorry, everyone. There's, I have to always do something wrong. Um, look, thanks everyone for joining us. Mark, have a wonderful day. Jane and Peter, have a, a, a wonderful night tonight. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared about the processes of examining and the, the mentality of examining. And um, it's just, it's such a great opportunity to be a part of a student's learning journey and process as they, um, I do whatever it is that music, the benefit that music brings their life. So thank you once again. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You, Sarah. thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye, Lewis. I'm getting there. End meeting.